we have with us Michael Nam, who will talk about out of thinner an assessment of the apport studies performed by Elmer Changeri Pap in Budapest. Michael is a researcher at the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health, the IGPP in Germany, and has published four books and numerous articles on poltergeists, huntings, mediumship, and the links between biology and psych. Without further ado, uh, I will clear the stage for our speaker. Hello, everybody, and thanks for the interesting presentations that I've been visiting so far. And I'd like to start with a few comments. There was a question whether there are any physical mediums in Hungary or the Czech Republic posted by somebody earlier. And of course, there are, as you can see now. So my talk will already be about one Hungarian medium. And there were several other Hungarian mediums. Another well-known one was Tibor Molnar, who was also studied by this particular Cengeri pub guy. Actually, that's this one. He's the leader of that uh, research in uh, Budapest at that time. And there was, of course, also Laszlo Laszlo, who was one of the most infamous mediums of all time because he was a really bad fraudster. And even there, there was a society founded to study his mediumistic phenomena. And he had confederates within that society that helped to hoax and uh, contrive all the phenomena that they studied. Even Frank Notzing was duped by Laszlo Laszlo. And in the Czech, Re Czech Republic, there have also been some mediums that were studied by Jan Shimsha. And so basically, it's, it's more a question of if there are researchers who study those mediums and then you get publications on them. So that's how you get to know about them. But they've been all around in each country in Europe, as I see the measures. All right. So this is Cengeri Pap, as I told you already. He was um, responsible for the studies that I'll be talking about. And this is the main medium that I will be talking about. He's a Lajos Pap, and Pap is a very common surname in Hungary, so they were not related at all. But all right, let's go. I'll present um, the investigations of Cengeri Pap, predominantly with Lajos Pap. And then I will also talk about sittings that Nando Fodor held with Lajos Pap in London. Nando Fodor was a Hungarian-born parapsychologist who later moved to America and then England, and he also tested this medium. And then I will talk about some current physical mediums, which I also have uh, some personal experience with, as you will see. And then I'll come to some conclusions. Okay, so a few words on Elmer Cengeri Pap. He was born in 1869, and I wasn't able to find out when he died, but he was at that time when he was um, <clears throat> still younger and had a job position. He was chief chemist at the Hungarian Civil Service in Budapest. So that was quite a high official, um, what's the word, job position. Yeah? And when he studied um, these mediums, he was already retired then. And for example, he was uh, responsible for the quality of wine. And I would suppose that he was also responsible for checking the quality of other beverages or food um, goods. And uh, he was born already into a quite religious and spiritualistic environment. His family was interested in all these uh, matters already. So he had early contacts with spiritualists. He visited seances quite early on. And in 1924, he had his first sittings with Lajos Pap. And only around that time, he then quit his job and went to full-time researching mediums. He went to a European tour in 1928. So he visited uh, the chief parapsychologists who were active around that time studying mediums, such as Frank Motzing in Munich, but also the guys that ran the IMI, IMI in Paris and uh, some people in Austria and uh, Vienna and so on. So he aimed at collecting experience. He aimed at checking how the others did their research. So he brought that knowledge home to establish this research also in Hungary, in Budapest. And he then later on founded what he called a metapsychological laboratory, specifically to study physical mediums and specifically to study Lajos Pap. Right. In this metapsychical laboratory, he also had an apport museum because Lajos Papp specialized on bringing apports, chiefly of uh, flowers and also later on then living animals, so for which he was quite known and it is, of course, a quite spectacular ability, if genuine. 
And these sittings were held about every two weeks on a regular course. And in 1938, he published a big, big book on what he did during that previous decade with his mediums. And also in that year, the medium Lajos Pub died, but I also didn't know, uh, don't know why and <clears throat> when exactly. And he also protocoled what happened quite detailedly. For example, we know that because of these protocols and given in his book and all the information that more than 200 guest sitters participated in these sittings in his laboratory. He aimed at promoting spiritualism, spiritualistic phenomena, and he invited numerous guests, predominantly from the higher social strata of Budapest and Hungary, to visit that stuff and to become yeah, impressed, um, if possible, about what happens in his laboratory. So after that, the Second World War came and it was very difficult to find additional information on what happened with Elmer Chengeri Pub and his um, laboratory. But I found a note saying that in 1942, he was still going strong. He, he did some spiritualistic publishing, but somehow, of course, he must have died and I didn't find out when and how. And I know from some sources that the museum, the Apport Museum that he had in the next room of his uh, laboratory was destroyed after the communist regime took over in Hungary around uh, after this or during and after the Second World War. But also, I don't know when exactly that happened. Okay, so a few words on the circle. So this is uh, the circle composition in 1933. It was a relatively stable circle. Those members who they, they visited this um, circle or the sittings for a number of years. So it was not a big change in the composition of the members. So I told you already that this is a Chengeri pub here. Where's the mouse? All right, all right, here. Then we have Lajos pub, the medium. That's the wife of Lajos pub. She participated in about half of all these sittings. Then we have a physician, we have another physician, and we have a bank director and the daughter of this bank director. So you can already see from this um, professions that they all belong to the higher social strata of Budapest. This is the book that he published in 1938. It's called Towards New Horizons in English. I don't even attempt to speak the Hungarian word. And he published two versions of it, one more expensive hardcover version and one softcover version. And the book is quite thick. It has more than 600 pages, lots of pictures, lots of plates. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a nice work. And obviously one of the largest monographs written by a single parapsychologist in our field. So this is a floor plan of the Metapsychical Laboratory he established in um, 1932. So you can see here the entrance. People came in here and they had the possibilities to socialize a bit, to talk, to chat and to change clothes or to um, take on their seance dresses. Um, you'll see it later and you saw it perhaps already. They had this peculiar one piece suit on in the later years and they had all these luminous stripes suit on these suits they would glow in the dark to make visible where they sat and which bodily position they had in the dark and then that was the door the main door leading into that room which was the actual laboratory the medium and the circle members would sit here or stand here and have the phenomena and document them here was a little second door. It was a mesh of wire. So in later years, they would leave this door open, lock only this door. And so here would sit a guy who would play music or who would take down stenographic notes that Cheng Rui Pub would dictate from inside of this room. Here is the museum. People can also sit there, chat there and all around the walls and also on the floor there were showcases in which the apports that Lajos Pap uh, produced throughout the years here in this laboratory were exposed and were shown displayed to interested people. I had a look on Google Maps and it seems the house is still existing. So it was located in the Mesjarosh street 
in Budapest, the second story. And if you match that floor plan onto the present house, it matches quite well. You see there are the two windows here. And also these angles of the house, well, it seems to be the same house still. And this is how it looks like from the side view and second story. So I don't know really what qualifies as the second story here in this um, building, but the phenomena I will be talking about took place behind either these windows or these windows. All right, a few words on Lajos Papp, the medium. He was a carpenter and in 2022 he produced first table phenomena. He visited a table phenomena seance and the table phenomena became more vigorous and it was soon discovered that might be because his me is present and he might have abilities that induce or um, strengthen these phenomena. In 22, he entered first trance states. In 28, systematic work with January Pap began. In 1930, he began clothing in these typical seance robes handed to him by Changri Pub. And then in 32, when also this uh, metapsychological laboratory was established, he began to speak in trance and began to report more and more living animals. Before speaking in trance, he would communicate with reps and the, the typology, the table would tilt and knock on the floor with the legs, which was obviously a very mm, arduous and uh, complicated and uh, way of communicating. So if, when the trans controls began to speak, that facilitated the communication greatly. Okay, and in this laboratory, he became the main medium. General Pub worked also with another medium, but they quit around that time. And in these 10 years to come, or in these 10 years since 28, Lajos Pub held 194 sittings with January Pub. And all of them are mentioned, and many of them are also described in the thick book I mentioned earlier. And then also in the same year when this book was published, Lajos Pub died for some unknown reason. And he's still uh, he was, um, as I mentioned, first famous for table phenomena. So this was one table that uh, Chengri Pub used. He specifically constructed it for his experiments on table lifting, table levitating. It was constructed as such. You couldn't lift it with uh, your legs or your knees because the knees and legs wouldn't stick uh, under the table. And it also it didn't have uh, a fixed tabletop, but this box and this box, you, you could put that into this um, frame and it would also uh, be a little bit deeper immersed than the edges of the frame. So you also couldn't lift it up with the fingers or whatever because, because it was a bit lower than the edges. But still this box frequently lifted um, out of this frame. So this was the way, one way Cheng Rui Pub attempted to document table phenomena in terms of mind-matter interactions, um, as uh, the title of the symposium suggests. Of course, apport phenomena, as mentioned, also qualify as mind-matter interactions. And um, Lajos Papp was famous for producing spontaneous apports in daily life, often not very surprisingly and often not very well document documentable. And then sometimes he would even apport objects from distant locations and from within, from within locked containers, but only very few times and are not so well documented, unfortunately. And then he was also famous for apporting liquids and living and also dead animals. So this is, for example, the situation depicting on how liquids were reported during seances. You can see the seance room, what was called the laboratory. There's a, few, a little cabinet in the corner that was usually never used. Then you see the windows, which were completely shut. You see some boards hanging on the walls and on the windows. They were luminous boards so that they would glow and offer some light in the dark room. And these are the people dressed in seance clothes, some of them, not all of them, obviously, on this particular occasion. And you see luminous stripes indicating the positions of the legs, arms, and so on. 
And so Lagos Pap, when he was about to produce liquid reports, he would take such a bottle, lift it above his head <clears throat> in the dark, and then liquids would pour into these bottles. And this is not a, a photograph taken during a seance, it is just uh, was taken outside of a seance context to illustrate how the situation was. And it also differs in from the real situations of the in the seances in that Lagos Pap looked to the circle. In the seances, he had the peculiar habit to always turn the back to the circle. So they wouldn't actually really see what was going on, apart from seeing where his body was, but he would turn away. And so he would actually be turned around when a ports of whatever kind, also liquid of liquid ports would occur. These are some examples of um, the showcases, because the book contains numerous photographs of these reports. So these reports uh, obtained in 33 and 34. And this is a specific a collection of Beatles over there. I have reproduced it here again. So on the 15th of July in 1933, he reported 15 living stag beetles along with other beetles and butterflies and some seeds and some stuff. And if uh, he would um, bring in some of these reports, he would stand up on this chair as usual and as in the picture shown just recently, and he would just snap these insects from the air and place them in the hand of Chengeri Pup or other sitters. And sometimes these animals were still alive and moving. Sometimes they seemed to be dead and just to revive within the next couple of minutes or you know, something like that. More showcase examples, you see um, these kind of crabs, you see birds, lizards, more lizards, fish. Sometimes fish were poured into these bottles with, along with water and, and, and algae and stuff like that. And these animals were typically all alive. Lots of plant stuff, other objects, leaves, and again, lots of crab trees. There were, there were uh, crab fish. There was a time in which he reported them quite frequently and not in that size they would be placed into an aquarium and grow and live for some years until they died and only then they would be placed into the um, showcases. This is a, the biggest animal that he reported. It is a sparrow hawk also in 1933. That was his great time of uh, apart phenomena. And also this animal, he just seemed to snap it from the air apparently catching the legs of it, and then he put it into the hands of Chengeri Pub, where it then seemed to become more and more alive, and it was put into a cage, because Lajos Pub also had the habit to announce which reports he will be bringing at specific seances, so people in Chengeri Pub could prepare for that to some extent. All right, Nando Foro, I mentioned it already, he was born in Hungary, so he was, of course, able to speak and understand Hungarian. And he sometimes traveled to Budapest, and so he also visited a seance of um, Lajos Pap in the laboratory of Chengeri Pap. And he was very impressed, and so when he returned to London, he arranged a series of sittings to be held in the facilities of the International Institute for Psychic Research, which was at that time run by him. He founded this, and, or he ran it, and so he arranged this visit. And they had 10 sittings in a room in which they tried to simulate as closely as possible the seance conditions in Budapest. And they also created these specific one-part suits for the seance with all these luminous stripes on it and so on. And here, this is supposed to be, uh, I think, a microphone. So Nando Fodor always reported what was happening in the seances all the time. And this microphone led to an adjacent room where somebody sat and took everything down and also in stenographic writing. So he was able to produce very accurate reports of these sittings. Also here, the sittings began quite interestingly. For example, with a snake apart, you can see there's a very thin snake hanging around uh, and dangling from Lajos Pap's finger. <clears throat> this is an infrared photograph. This, you see Nanda Foda. They arranged having things photographed if possible. And so this took place every now and then. 
But then it didn't take long and Fodor got increasingly concerned because at first they thought, well, we create a very friendly and hospital, um, yeah, hospitality, you know, for um, Lajos Papp so that he can feel at home, feel safe, feel good, because it's known that under these conditions, phenomena of physical mediumship work best. And only then they would successively tighten the control conditions and there to be sure that really the, the genuine, uh, the phenomena were genuine. <clears throat> but Lajos Papp didn't like that too much. And then even occurred this event when um, Lajos Papp was allegedly producing ectoplasm but this photograph clearly showed that it's a it's, um, handkerchief that is supposed to be sticking here. The, all the people are wearing their, their seance suits and they had no clothes, no nothing, but they had this little um, um, option or possibility to, to, to stick a handkerchief on the outside to this um, suit. And it's clearly missing here, but it's clearly sticking in. Um, Lajos Papp's mouth here, and so very obvious. And after this seance, when this was uh, this uh, picture was developed, Lajos Papp also admitted to the AI, yeah, it was it wasn't ectoplasm, it, it was my handkerchief, but but it was a joke. It was supposed to be a joke. I, I'm not so stupid to claim I produce ectoplasm where it's obvious then that, that it's only my handkerchief. But at that time, it sounded quite different, and it was quite disturbing for the. English visitors of this seance because it was apparently at least at the time that it was produced not apparently apparent that it was a, a joke. So there were more suspicious things that then occurred during the sittings. It was of course agreed upon that at a certain time Lajos Papp needs to take the clothes off so that his body and the clothes could be checked and he simply refused to do that. At one point, he agreed to that grudgingly in later uh, seances, but it still left the shoes on. And then when he was asked uh, to take the shoes off, he still refused it. And only then it became, became apparent that contrary to what Cheng Pup has always said, he actually never took the boots off in Budapest. So the, 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 the trousers and the shoes were hardly ever controlled in Budapest or although Cheng Rui Pap has always claimed that he was searched from head to toe. More peculiarly, one reason why Lajos Pap refused to take the shoes off was he said, well, I wear shoes with elastic laces and shoes with elastic laces are very difficult to put on again. So that was, of course, first of all, nonsense. And secondly, it's also quite peculiar that a physical medium would wear shoes with elastic laces. I know nobody who wears shoes of elastic laces, and I think 100 years ago it was even more unusual to wear such laces, and one wonders why should somebody wear them at all. He also made very peculiar arm movements, specifically always before some phenomena or port phenomena occurred, it was noted that he seemed to be some, making some throwing movements. And when Nando Fodor dictated these movements, allowed so that they can be uh, re recorded for the microphone. And then ah, now it's also phenomena are now also occurring. Cheng Rui Pap intervened and complained that he would talk too much and record too much. And this would disturb the flow of the sittings, which was also rather odd from the view of Nandra Fodor. And uh, Lajos Pap also just sometimes gave wrong information. For example, one, at one point he something dropped in the dark seance room and he said it was a glass object and but it never was found and then later before the next seance when he entered the room he said ah he found a metal nut he said ah Neil, that's the, the object i uh, brought it uh, last time and it belongs to a specific machine but it neither belonged to this machine and of course it's also stupid that a glass object had suddenly become a metal nut so this was simply not true <coughs> And finally, it was also found that a gold coin that he imported in the last seance uh, was in fact taken from the suitcase of Cheng Rui Pap, which for safety reasons he deposited in the hotel room of Lajos Pap. And when they looked 
and checked if this coin really belonged to this surface, it was apparently found that the hiding place for the gold coins that Chang Yi Pub had in this suitcase was cut and glued again. And so this was some kind of damning evidence in the eyes of Nandor Foda, but for some reasons I never really understood, Nandor Foda failed to confront Lajos Pub and Chang Yi Pub with this finding that the case was broken and the, the hiding place glued. Anyway, it's also interesting that only after the third sitting it was found, that, well, that was the time uh, that uh, Lajos Pap took his clothes off for basically the first time, grudgingly, he wore a kidney belt. And also this kidney belt was never ever mentioned before in, city, in, in the sittings in Budapest or when he was searched before in Budapest. And this is how this kidney belt looked like. It was kind of a white cloth and um, Lajos Pap also refused to take this off when being searched because that would no, wouldn't be no good for his kidneys. And Foro had some reasons to question also that. So this is a typical scenario about uh, of how Lajos Pap was searched in Budapest before seances and you see that people just felt with a hand in between the, the skin and this kidney belt, which was of course multi-layered and apparently the, the trousers and the shoes were not taken off at all, at least on many occasions. Other peculiarities of Lajos Papp's phenomena or conduct during uh, the seances were that he was always the boss. <clears throat> For example, photographs or whatever happened in the seance room was only possible after he gave explicit, explicit consent or when he um, yeah, commanded it on its own behalf or to control personalities, of course. Then he had all these peculiar automatic movements stigma, and he digmagnetization movements that would also include that before sittings would terminate, he would completely leave the circle, go into a remote corner of the room, turn the back to the uh, sitters, perform peculiar movements, and when he was ready with that, and he would only return then and terminate the sittings. Then I found it peculiar that the, all the insects that he aborted had a different survival rate. So the beetles, for example, were usually always alive. So they are quite sturdy animals and it's not so easy to, to kill them, for example, as um, fragile butterflies or some smaller um, dragonflies he aborted. They were often dead and never, uh, or, or, <laughs> no, or more rarely recovered uh, or they were often, often also damaged. So if we assume that the insects were really just materializing out of thin air, I would expect that the survival rate would be similar and that also the, the bodily condition would be similar. So you wouldn't expect the, the more uh, fragile insects to be damaged or to be dead more often than the more sturdy insects. Then it was also peculiar that the liquids always materialized outside of the bottles. That was evidence because some Times the, the liquids would pour next to the bottle down to the chairs and the floor, for example. And <clears throat> I always wondered anyway, if it is possible to apport liquids into closed rooms, why didn't they just try to let the liquids uh, materialize in closed bottles? Why did they have to be open at all and ideally have a wide opening? So in case it's a genuine apport, so why didn't this just appear in the bottle itself or even insects and other objects why didn't they occur in closed tiny containments instead of a huge seance room which is of course much more difficult to control and Chang Yi Pap never really said anything about it apart from a, um, a short note that he casually mentioned that um, experiments with tiny containments wouldn't really work with Lajos Pap. Chang Yi Pap himself also presented some very peculiar um, items in, in this book, or he omitted to present them. For example, he never really discussed that the light conditions were rather poor in the course of his seances. He generally said they were very good because of all these luminous um, items he draped around the walls and on the bodies of the sitters. But in fact, before the major phenomena occurred, the control personality of Lajos Pap always demanded that these luminous items should be turned around and covered so that the room became dark, much, much darker than usual. 
and January Pub just didn't comment on this and always stressed that uh, the light conditions were very good, which is obviously not the case. I mentioned already that he never really expanded with small containers, which in my opinion would have been quite reasonable. He also never mentioned financial dependencies of his mediums because apparently he paid them and they, they lived in his facilities and all that stuff because the carpenter business of Laios Pub didn't run well and also the other medium who was a painter didn't also run well. So they were really dependent on financial um, input of Tengeri Pub. And I think if, if a medium is being paid for a living by an experimenter, that's not something you should hide from your reports. So these are only a few examples showing that Cheng Wei Pub's thick, thick book is often lacking appropriate documentation. <clears throat> Even the very interesting experiments concerning, for example, locked places or locked um, reports from locked places or the hand controls, protocol writings, all that stuff. It's really not, not convincing. Take, for example, these pictures. In Tengri Pub's book and other reports, you read that his hands were always continuously controlled. But if you look at the four pictures contained in his book that show Lajos Pub in action, on all four photos, his right hand is obviously not controlled at all, but the sitter on the right holds Lajos' hand here somewhere at the shoulder or the upper arm. It's obviously not the hand. And we only learn from Nando Fodor, in, who also wrote a report on his 10 sittings, that Lajos Pap told the sitter next to him, now you have to move your hand up to my shoulder, which was apparently always done, and then the phenomena commenced. I mean, that sounds quite different than saying, well, his hands have always been con under perfect control. It's a kind of reminiscent of uh, the, the, the similar lab of Jelay, who, when in his experiments with Eva C, also told uh, his readers that Eva's hands were always held by the sitters left and right, but on the photos that Jelly included in his book, it was obviously not the case. Eva's hands were also free. So here's another peculiarity of Tengeri Pap. He said, Lajos Pap had so big hands, he was so clumsy, so he cannot have um, performed any tricks with them. So in his book, he included these photographs. Here are hands, the hand of Lajos Pub, front and back side. And this is the hand of a conjurer, a professional conjurer. And Chengeri Pub argued, look at these hands. This is such a big hand. And how can this big hand in comparison to this tiny, small um, hand ever be accomplishing um, trickery? But I wonder, is it really so much larger? I took, I placed this, this type of element here and just copied it on the other side to the other hand <clears throat> without changing the size. And if you just move it to the correct place, approximately matching the same position, it's so very identical. Also here, I just copied it to the other side, <clears throat> applying it to a similar position. It's identical, the size. And the, the only apparent difference is that Lajos Pap holds his hand like this and the conjurer like this. And Chengri Pap concludes, because of this difference in size, Lajos Pap's hands were entirely unusable to perform any tricks. And this line of reasoning is, in my opinion, yeah, it's misleading and it's uncritical. And it's it doesn't throw a good light on the, the critical attitude of somebody who argues in such ways. All right, time is running and passing. I will now still add an excursus introducing some more recent mediums to you because I think insight into how mediums frequently practice physical mediums is also important and good to know if you want to judge upon historical mediums that are long gone and you don't have any real possibility to experiment on further. So physical mediums of today, there was one John Stave or Herbert Baumann who died some 20 years ago. And actually um, present mediums, current mediums 
are, for example, Michael Shane, Warren Kaler, Gary Mannion, and my good old friend Kai Mügge. And I will first talk about John Staff a bit and then predominantly about Kai. John Staff, he lived at that time, and he was also specialized on bringing a port, specifically stones like gems and uh, um, half gems, but even up to rubies and diamonds and all that stuff. But they were still <laughs> worthless, unfortunately, because they had these peculiar cracks in them. Some, so much so at times that previously clear stones were completely opaque. You couldn't see through them. They were full of these cracks and sometimes they would even just fall apart and crack into numerous pieces. And it was also interesting that these reports were usually hot when they appeared during seances, but also very often spontaneously in daily life. So when my friend Ilo Brandt von Ludwiger, who spent some time with John Star John Starve, they were good friends, these, these stones would just appear on a regular base. And they were always kind of cracked and also um, hot. And on one occasion, Ilo Brandt even observed a port appear in daylight in the middle of the air and then falling to the, the floor like um, snowflakes. So that seems to be really a quite interesting medium I have been. And I also, I, I tried to reproduce some of these um, peculiar cracks. So this is an um, original report produced by Jan Stav. And you can see these rigid uh, and ragged um, corners. It's broken, the stone. So you see that the cracks are really very convoluted and, and not very straight. So I bought some pieces of mountain crystal like different types, the round ones, the, the, the and cut pieces, and also natural pieces. And I tried to find ways. If presuming this is not a, um, a hoax, how could I possibly create such a um, hoax? So I I froze them, threw them into hot water. I put them into microwave uh, machines and all that stuff, ultrasound stuff. And <clears throat> I wasn't able to produce anything that came close to these types of cracks. It is true that they cracked. But these cracks usually were rather large and plain, um, um, straight. It was not possible to, for me at least, to create anything that came remotely close to these types of cracks in the stones of John Starve. So that's a very interesting support medium, in my opinion, but unfortunately no longer among us. Ilo Brand and I, we, we wrote a publication on that. In Ilo Brand summarized his experiences with uh, Jan Stavis, so you can check that in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, and I've also put that on my website. Modern commercial physical mediums. I wrote on them also here, but I won't go into detail very much now. This is Michael Shane. He's from Northern America. Then in, in, in the UK, we have Warren Kaler. In Germany, we have Kai Mücke. In Australia, we have Gary Mannion. So I will try to make it short. Gary Mannion. Ah, I should have mentioned, if these, if these mediums produce supports, they are never hot, or with room temperature. Gary Mannion, he was exposed some time ago as being a fraudulent medium. You can see him here. He, here's his cabinet. He freed himself from the bonds he was tied to the chair with, and then he left the, the, the cabinet. He undressed himself halfway, and then he created the, the cool paranormal wind that so many people talk about in seances, the cool breezes, by waving his shirt. And here you can see uh, the levitating trumpet traveling uh, through the air and uh, talking to sitters and tapping their heads. But of course, it's, it's not really levitating. Gary is carrying it. And here you see him producing ectoplasm. This is uh, the sitter sitting on here. Here he sits on that chair. The curtains of the cabinet have been removed. Here his hand, head is slightly bent forward and you can see the ectoplasm hanging here. And every now and then he manipulates it and, and, and makes it longer and all that stuff. So he was filmed because of um, suppositions that he might be a fraudulent. A complete seance was filmed with this infrared camera and it really nicely shows that it was all fraud from start to end. Coming now to Kai Mücke, <laughs> he made it even on the cover of the Paranormal Review not too long ago. I know him quite well. I visited 21 seances altogether with him, and I visited him for a number of years, from 2008 until 2013. So this was the 
um, typical sitting in his cellar in Hanau around the time that he began to develop his class mediumship. But it also it began with very interesting table phenomena, also apports, and only thereafter he slowly began to develop more and more his um, trans mediumship for which he became famous later on. So for example, take uh, the essence of ectoplasm. Um, I, I can say already now that I found out that he was a fake, at least the, the trans phenomena. So here's the essence of ectoplasm. It's this, this tiny vital energy that he would use to uh, have lift from his hand and then travel um, around his body a bit. He used to present that as the highlight of his seances around 2011. But we found out that this was a... Ah, where's the... Ah, no. Here's something missing, of course. I can, uh, that's me, as you can imagine. And I can also produce this. Uh, I have a picture that should be here, but it got apparently lost by converting it into open office. So we found out, another sitter and I, that what he used here was a fake thumb, a, a rubber thumb you put on your thumb and there's a long thread and at the top of it there's a tiny little red lamp and of course that's what he uses here. You can switch it on and off and it blinks and it has an impulse frequency of 25 blinkies per second and so <clears throat> the fake thumb has it, the essence of ectoplasm has it as well. You can see that it looks very, very similar. The things you can do with a fake thumb really looks like ectoplasm essence. And eventually Kai even confessed having used this device, which is called the light flight. So with this confession and with these photos and other evidence, it was of course clear that also his trance was faked and all the speech that he does during that trance and also the ectoplasm as a whole, because he showed that ectoplasm often in conjunction with um, this sea light flight. So, uh, at a time. Of course, if that's fake, the ectoplasm down there is of course also fake, and we also uh, know that he bought large amounts of heroin cobweb to simulate ectoplasm, for example, like that. This is Kaimukis ectoplasm, this is my cobweb, and you can see all these characteristical zigzag um, patterns that both show. So there's really no question that uh, Kai's ectoplasm is nothing but uh, yeah. Well, one specific type of his ectoplasm is um, this Halloween cobweb. And he also claimed there's so many differences between ectoplasm and cobweb. It cannot possibly be cobweb, but I see no difference at all, to be honest. Yeah, apports. Kai produces eye apports. Some people think, well, that's really cool and that must be genuine, but it, of course, it's not really that impressive to me. I can produce eye apports just as he can. I've not seen any eye apport that I cannot produce as well. It's very easy to stick things down here under the eyelids, so it doesn't even hurt. And I can carry things around there for hours without bothering and then put them out again when I want to produce an apport. So that's really easy. Okay. A few words on full materializations. That's his latest specialty. John King, Henry Alcott, Jim Morrison, we see in his seances. But first of all, I wonder in Jim Morrison's case, why is here that peculiar um, whitish line? Is it perhaps a wig that this um, materialization does wear? Why is there a black bar in front of his eyes now? There would be the possibility to show a bright, beautiful face of a full materialization on Kai's blog, but he puts that black bar in front of his eyes. So what? What's that for? Never, but never understood that. And if you took take some pictures of Kai in comparison, I think it's obviously that these people look like very similar, especially the nose and the broad parts of his face. Or uh, this is also very funny. Many female apparitions also appear in Kai's seances, but you never see anything of the female faces because they're always covered in something, like here and. Yeah, Jim Morrison's beard is very dark, the hair is very light, maybe that's the same wig you see. I don't know, it's only speculation, but it's still quite um, preposterous and I really don't understand how anybody can seriously believe that that's genuine. But I, I don't know what to make of Kai's table phenomena. I experienced some really weird things down there, so in this respect I keep my opinion open. Anyway, I have to hurry up. End of this excursus was basically to show that at least the current physical mediums are, in my opinion, frauds. So what does that tell us for this nice bunch of 
people. Also, Lavish Pub supports were never hot in comparison to, for example, your Starvey supports. I just remind you of all these other peculiarities that he refused to take his clothes off and his shoes, elastic laces, all that stuff, kidney belt, his very well controlled hands and wrists. All right, so I'm coming to my conclusions. So, Lajos Papi really produced very impressive phenomena, and he, they were quite superior to the phenomena produced by current mediums, which are really, really low level. But um, unfortunately, the controls and also the presentation about how Cheng Wei Pap presented his controls and his science reports uh, were very inadequate. And by doing this, Cheng Wei Pap discredited, in my opinion, his own work as an author and as a researcher. The question is the crucial question, what can we believe him? Is, was it, is it really true what he told us about how the sciences were controlled and what happened? Or was he blind and selectively uh, presented only the good things? So Nandor Fodor's report, to the contrary, was a masterpiece of really good documentation or, and investigation. And that shows that it's always very important to have opinions of independent other investigators who have a different view on the matters and fly a different mindset. And may, it may be able to discover things that others can't discover. So you have to be friendly, of course, but you need to be critical still if you study physical mediumship and you don't have to become an uncritical friend or blind supporter, what may have been the case in Shanghai Pub. These people are the perfect victims and the preferred victims by these physical mediums of today, at least. So, but because the phenomena were so amazing of, of Lajos Pap, I think, honestly, they must, um, the opinion must be left open. It's inconclusive what to make of them. On a personal level, I'm rather pessimistic, but still, I'm, I'm not saying he was a fraud. One cannot say that at the present state of the affairs especially for the table phenomena, um, goes that also. Still, I think mediums who produce ectoplasm and operate in darkness during the, the decisive stages of seances, they are very suspicious and probably fraudsters. So we really must be careful there. And nevertheless, Chen Repub's book remains of historical significance because it highlights pitfalls and lessons to be learned in studying physical mediumship. Still, again, macro PK in, in mind matter interaction, such as reports, they might still happen. We must be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there were many other very interesting mediums who did not produce suspicious ectoplasm or work in, in darkness, such as D.D. Hume, Mazapia Pal um, Palladino, Stella Crenshaw is very interesting, Indridi Indridason, Eleonora Zugun, there are many others. They, I consider them really interesting and more, have more positive attitudes towards them. And there's, of course, many other psi phenomena, all the other interesting survival research going on. And I dare say it, I also think UFO, UFO phenomenology is very interesting because there are so many parallels to parapsychological phenomena, specifically in physical mediumship. So studying this phenom phenomenology might bridge parapsychology and UFO research in, in my opinion, especially the recent years, have really substantiated that there's something about this UFO stuff. And of course, if they are here, they don't travel with uh, with, uh, with an engine and fuel, they must be able to manipulate space, perhaps also time. So maybe we can regard a UFO also as a type of an apart that materializes in the atmosphere of our planet or whatever. So and whatever these UFOs are, and I'm not even sure they are aliens, but there's something there, and whatever it is, it must operate with some kind of knowledge about how to handle the psychic background reality of our existence, and so maybe that's also something that will be very interesting um, in the future to follow this development, and I'm very optimistic that, yeah, there will be um, in interesting times ahead. All right. This is my website and also several of my publications on physical mediumship and other stuff. You can find it there in the publications and download sections. And now I, I hasten to conclude my talk. I hope it wasn't too fast and too much, but um, I'm sure there are some minutes for questions left. Thank you.